Um, let me just invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, and we're kicking off a new series today. I'm going to pray over these in just a minute. Um, keying kind of a little bit off the fun we had last week with um, the Mission Impossible theme, and our new series is called Mission Possible, uh, because we're going to look at this kind of the, the whole theme of biblical stewardship and our, our role that we play in fulfilling and carrying forward God's mission in the world. And, uh, and so we're going to look at the very kind of foundational text where God gives humanity its missional mandate to be caretakers and stewards of all that God has entrusted to us. So let's listen in, and then I'll pray, and we'll pray over these, um, these shoe boxes in just a moment, starting at verse 26 in Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with, its, with seed and its fruit. And you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And that's where we're going to pause. All of this, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you this morning, as Dan reminded us, with so much to be grateful for, this world that you have created, this beautiful world with so many diverse and wonderful aspects to it. And God, you have entrusted this beautiful, diverse world into our care and so, God, we ask that as we take a few moments this morning to ponder our privilege and our responsibility to be good caretakers, Lord, that you would speak to us by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, enliven and quicken our hearts to hear whatever it is that your Holy Spirit wants to say. God, we take these gifts that are laid before you this morning on this communion table and surrounding area, and we dedicate them to you. Not just our financial gifts, but also these gifts that have been lovingly prepared for children around the world who might otherwise not ever receive any gifts during this time of year, a special time of year. And we have an opportunity through these gifts to extend the love of Christ, God, as, a, as an expression of our stewardship care for those whose names we don't know, but who are part of the human family and matter to you, and so they matter to us. So God, would you just take these gifts? You know exactly where they're going. You know which, which child will receive which box, and we pray that you would bless them and that they would find a home in the hearts of those children, and not just all the cool things that are in these boxes, but that they would feel as they open them, they would feel the sense of your incredible, boundless love for them. And it's to that end that we dedicate them and give them with glad and generous hearts, Lord, because we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, probably you have, if you've been paying attention all the last several uh, months uh, during this pandemic, but the uh, real estate market, not just here in Atlanta, but all over the country, is absolutely white hot. In fact, some of our own folks have chosen to take advantage of this, sell their home, and move somewhere else, right? Um, we miss them, but it's, it's understandable. It's just one of those crazy phenomenons that during this pandemic, things have just kind of gone, gone wild. And, and uh, I don't know if that's beginning to settle down uh, yet, but it's certainly up, up until this point has been very, very white hot. And it's an interesting phenomenon uh, to, to know that home values and the selling prices, they're at record highs. And what's interesting is that folks seem to want more and more for their home dollars, right? They, we, we get accustomed slowly over time to having more and more features. We want more and more bells and whistles. We want them in our car, on our phone, 
and in our houses, right? What, what, what used to satisfy us years ago doesn't seem to satisfy us anymore. I remember years and years ago when the whole granite countertop thing became a thing, right? And if you were trying to sell your house and you had, heaven forbid, Formica countertops, <laughs> even nice ones, yeah, you were just, you, 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 you couldn't compete on the market. You had to have. And so now the expectation is, right, when you go in, it's got to have at least that, if not, you know, lots and lots of other bells and whistles. Home sizes keep, uh, keep growing, keep adding features. Um, do you know what the average square footage per person was in 1950 in the American home? 250 feet. 250 square feet per person in the average American home in 1950. Anybody want to take a guess at what it is today? Over 900. We now require over 900 square feet per person in every household on average in the American home. And, and interestingly enough, uh, according to the Self Storage Association, which is an industry tracking group that looks at these kind of trends on a large kind of macro level across the country, people are putting more and more stuff out of these larger homes and into storage areas. Uh, and this trade group says that the country now possesses some 1.9 billion square feet of personal storage space outside the home. And all this space is contained in ne nearly 40,000 facilities owned and operated by more than 2,000 entrepreneurs, including a handful of publicly traded giants like Public Storage, Storage USA, and SureGuard. And according to the survey, owners uh, of one out of every 11 homes own a self-storage space. Perhaps some of you do. Most operators of self-storage facilities report that 90% occupancy is the norm. And there's been a huge jump. This one out of every 11 represents a 75% increase since 1995. Most folks are renting these storage spaces for a minimum of about 15 months. And it's an industry that has experienced exponential growth in recent years. If you're looking for a place to invest, I think personal storage is probably a safe bet right now because it continues to grow. Even though the size of the American family is actually shrinking, according to demographers. People are having smaller families, larger homes that need off-site storage. According to the National Association of Home Builders, reports that the average house grew from 1,660 square feet in 1973 to 2520 in 2021. So, just put all those pieces together. Families got smaller, houses got bigger, and yet we still need to tack on almost 2 billion square feet of personal storage space. Now, what's up with that? Like, like how, how much stuff is enough. Like how, how much we, we, we keep hearing this is going to be a great holiday season and the consumer is ready to spend. There's all this pent up money and pent up demand and so they're going to spend. spend. They might actually, but more than likely that, that frenetic sense of spending will inevitably result in the accumulation of what? More stuff. VeggieTales did a whole episode on this called Stuff Mart. <laughs> Any of you remember that? Yeah. It, it, we, we have all this stuff, right? And how much of it do we really own anyway? House, car, boat, RV, all that stuff. Who really owns most of that? The bank, right? <laughs> In most cases, at least with those big ticket items, the bank is the one that typically holds the note on those things, unless we're, we're, we're privileged enough to be able to pay some of those things off. But in reality, we, we, we don't own a lot of that stuff that we have. And as I was pondering this, this reality of kind of where we're at as a nation with our, our insatiable appetite for accumulation, I, I thought about what a sharp contrast it, it is to, to this biblical vision of being a steward that you find here in Genesis 1, the very first kind of missional mandate that God gives the human race is to take care of not something that they have made, but that he has made. And he's entrusting it to their care. Look at, look at what it says in verse 29. What does it say? And God blessed them, and God said, Behold, I 
have given you everything. You didn't give this to yourself. You didn't create this yourself. I have given it to you. And I've entrusted it to your care. We, 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 we like to think that it's ours, that everything we have belongs to us. But in fact, we are just caretakers. We're stewards of what has been entrusted to us. We don't really own it at all. In fact, the psalmist underscores that. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm uh, 50. I want you to see this. God does a, an amazing thing through the pen of the psalmist here in Psalm 50, starting in verse 10. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. Did you, did you, did you catch that, that refrain? They're, they're, they're mine. They belong to me. I'm the one who created them. I'm the sovereign one. I own them, as it were, but I'm giving them to you to bless you, to enjoy, for you to take care of and to have at your disposal. We keep thinking it belongs to us. I mean, you know, everybody wants to own a piece of paradise, right? Go to some resort town on the mountains or on the beach and, and just, just look at the expansive amount of, of growth and the, the new building, and, and, and the lots keep getting smaller and smaller, don't they? Because everybody wants their, their slice of, of paradise. The only trouble is, sometimes nature has a different, a different storyline in mind. Just ask the people on the coastlines of Florida or, or New Orleans, right? When the hurricanes move in and just wipe it all out, and then your little piece of paradise doesn't, it doesn't amount to much. Because we really, even if we can enjoy those places, and, those, and there's nothing wrong with that, but even if we can enjoy those kind of places and those gifts, at the end of the day, we're stewards and caretakers. That's an awesome privilege as well as a tremendous responsibility to be a caretaker of something that has been entrusted to us. God has given us the things that we have, our, our houses, our cars, our clothes, the things that we have. And yes, we work hard, many of us work hard to, to, to buy, you know, earn the money to pay those things. And, and so because we do, sometimes it's tempting to think, well, I have done this. I have achieved this. And we forget that we were created by a creator who created us uniquely with the gifts and the skills and the aptitudes and the passions and the good health that allow us to earn the money to afford the things that we have and to be stewards of what has been entrusted to us. We are, in fact, fiduciaries, to put it bluntly. A fiduciary is someone who manages assets on behalf of someone else and puts their interests above their own. We are fiduciaries. We have a responsibility to take care of this world to the best of our abilities. And I assume that we're going to have to give an accounting for how we did at some point. The Bible seems to suggest as much, right? And part of what I think we're going to have to give an accounting for is how did we do with our stewardship? of our lives, of the things that God put in our hands? Did we just use them for ourselves, or did we use them for something greater than ourselves? Someone greater than ourselves, right? In His interest. So, how are you doing as a fiduciary? Are you getting a five-star rating, or are you junk bond status? <laughs> right? Think about it. We, we, that's how we rate investments, right? And those who take care of them and those who manage them. And, and, and I think it's good sometimes for us to take stock of our own lives and how we're living and, and how we're caring for the things that we have and the world around us and investing our time and our energy to be good stewards and good caretakers and using those resources that God has put at our disposal not simply for our own pleasure and to meet our own needs, but to invest them, to lay up treasures in heaven. Amen? Where neither thieves break in, nor rust can, can decay, nor moth eat away. 
Don't you hate it when you walk into your closet or whatever and there's a moth that's gotten a hold of one of your nice sweaters and you're just like, and you can't like, especially if it's a nice cashmere, or you can't repair that stuff, like, not easily anyway. It's just gone. It's like a hole that's maybe th three millimeters big, but you're like, yeah, it's, I can't wear that now. And you just know that that stuff just decays. Stuff degenerates. And Jesus says, that's the reality of the world you live in, so be wise about how you use the resources you have and invest them for something greater than yourself. Because this life that you and I are li li living right now is just a blip on the screen. Just a blip. Someone once gave this illustration to me. He said, imagine a, a little bird, a little songbird, taking a grain of sand from the earth and putting it in its beak and flying up and depositing it onto the moon's surface and then turning around and flying back and getting another grain of sand and flying up and depositing it on the moon's surface. And by the time he transfers all the grains of sand from Earth's surface to the moon's surface, eternity will just have reached the close of its first day. This life you and I are leading and living is just a blip on the screen, and yet it is so pregnant with possibility and opportunity and privilege and responsibility to take good care of it. Jesus sort of hints at as much in his parable of the talents in Matthew 25. Turn there if you would with me. I know this is a somewhat familiar passage to some, but it bears kind of repeating and rereading, starting at verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. And he who had received the five talents went at once. He traded with them, made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I've made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. And, and here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I, I went and just hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered seed. You, you ought to at least have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take that talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. Everyone who has will be more given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast this worthless servant out in the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And on that happy note, we'll end right there, right? <laughs> I mean, doesn't mince words, does he? What, what, notice this, this pattern, right? The, the, the master, the householder, gives these, these investments. These, he entrusts them to them. To one he gives a five, the other he gives a two, and the other one he gives a one. The, 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 really, the point is not who gets how much. The point is... What do you do with what you have? How are you managing what, what's been entrusted to you, whether it's a lot or a little? And the, there's two that seem to actually make some effort and try to take their role as stewards seriously. And the other one who just kind of says, eh, I can't be bothered. I got, I just, I'm just going to go about my life and do whatever I want to do and live however I want to live. To which Jesus says in this parable, the householder does not respond very favorably, right? And, and the whole point is not how much do you have, but what are you doing with what you do have for a purpose that is greater than yourself? And how are you using your talents, literally, your experience, your education, your expertise, your physical resources, your home, your car, your finances, your skills, your knowledge, your relational bandwidth? 
How are you using all of those gifts that God has put in your hand for God's kingdom purposes, to put them at His disposal? And to say, God, I, I, all of this, it belongs to you in the first place. I just get to take care of it for a while. And so I want to do the best I can with what I have. And that's, that's the only thing that really comes to the fore in this. And, and we as a church are trying to do the same thing. We don't have unlimited resources here. We don't even have as m many resources as some other big churches, right? We have limited resources. And it's not so much what we have or don't have, as the case may be. What's, what's really important is what are we doing with what we do have? And how are we investing and caring for the resources that are at our disposal, this space, these grounds, the funds, the mission partnerships, the kind of things that God has entrusted to our care? Are we maximizing those assets and those resources for God's kingdom impact? I hope so. We're trying to. And we want to continue to lean into that as much as we possibly can. Amen? Amen. So that people can experience the joy of being set free in Christ and finding the hope that they desperately seek in this life. God has given us many resources, both individually and collectively, together. And collectively, we pool those individual resources, don't we? We join together as teams. We serve together. We, we, we bring our gifts, our financial gifts, and we invest it here so that it can then be put to use for God's kingdom work, like supporting things like Haggai and other ministry partners where we can't go. We can't be in all those places. But we can take the resources that God has put in our hands and say, God, here you go. I'm putting some of it at your disposal to do whatever you want with for your kingdom's sake in this world. Reaching students, discipling young children, sharing the gospel in the far corners of the world, feeding hungry people, doing the kinds of things that Jesus did and encouraged us to do. But I want to say one last thing before I end this morning. God has not just entrusted the material resources of this world to us to be good stewards of. He's also entrusted us to each other to be good stewards of our relationships. There's a human dimension to being faithful stewards. You don't have to read very far into the early narrative of Genesis to see how the story goes badly awry. So God gives Adam and Eve, these first parents, this missional mandate, here's the world, enjoy it, savor it, take good care of it. And then they have a couple of kids. <laughs> and all bets are off. Right? Amen, Mom and Dad? <laughs> and you know the story. Like Things don't go very well with these two kids, Cain and Abel. And Cain lets his own self-interest, his own jealousy and self-absorption get the better of him, and he fails to recognize that in his brother, he has this tremendous gift and instead acts out of his own selfish interest and ends up killing him the very first homicide in the pages of Scripture, and it, and it happens within the first couple of pages of Scripture. It's really heartbreaking when you stop and think about it. He failed to recognize. And when God shows up on the scene in the narrative, he says to Cain, where's your brother? And you can all just almost hear the sarcasm and the, and the cynicism just dripping off of Cain's mouth as he responds, how should I know? Am I my brother's keeper? Well, I don't care. And then God asks him this penetrating question. What have you done? What have you done? I gave you this gift. The gift of a brother. And you disregarded his humanity. His inestimable worth and value. You killed him. 
You were not a faithful steward of that relationship gift that I just gave you. As I was pondering that this week, I, I couldn't help but think of the wall-to-wall nonstop coverage in the news these days of some of the high-profile trials that are happening. Kyle Rittenhouse and the men who ended up shooting Ahmaud Arbery, both of which are getting tons and tons of coverage. It remains to be seen how those trials will play themselves out. I'm no attorney, I'm no judge, I'm no member of a jury, so we'll see how, how that all plays itself out. But I, as, I, as I listened in, I thought, when you peel back all the layers of all the details of these cases, what you, what you get to is this heartbreaking reality. That the value and the worth of those human beings that were killed was just disregarded. They were created in God's image. And yes, tensions were high, and I get all of that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a heartbreaking reflection of our, of our brokenness as humanity when we're killing each other. Amen? Amen. And I'm not trying to be political. I'm just saying at a human level, that's what, that's what we're dealing with. We're broken when we fail to be good stewards of the people and the humans that God has put in our life. In fact, Paul says, be careful about this. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. I want you to see this because it's, it's easy to miss this. And as you're, as you're turning there, you, most of you probably are at least somewhat familiar with the uh, Ten Commandments. You ever heard of that? Anybody ever heard of that before? Yeah. Have you ever noticed there's a, there's a kind of a distinctiveness between the Ten Commandments, the first part and the second part? The first part has a decidedly kind of vertical element to it. Like, don't have any, I don't worship any other gods before me, honor me, right? It, it, it has mostly to do with our relationship with the Creator. But when you get to the second half, the d dimensionality changes to a more horizontal nature. Don't kill each other. Don't bear false witness against each other. Don't sleep with each other's spouses. Like, don't do the stuff that are, that's going to tear the, the fabric of the human community apart. Because you're made for relationship. And I've put the people in your life that I've put there as a gift to you to preserve and to protect. And that's the sentiment that Paul echoes in, in Galatians 5 when he writes this, starting in verse 13. You were called to freedom, brothers. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. They're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You notice how many of things in that list are, 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 are about caring for and, and not tearing down the relationships in your community? But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of which, by the way, you can't really learn to live out as an, in an island. You have to live them out in the context of community, right? I can't learn to be gentle just by living by myself or self-controlled or loving. I have to be in proximity and in relationship with other people. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So let's not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. <laughs> 
This is one of those one another passages in the New Testament. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but there's a Greek word that's pronounced alelon, which you find over a hundred times in the New Testament. It's usually each other or one another. And it keeps reoccurring over and over and over and over again. Because maybe we have a hard time getting it. I don't know. But the writers of the New Testament just over and over again. And you should do, if you've never done kind of a word study on that phrase, one another or each other throughout the New I, I would strongly encourage you to do it because when you read it kind of in toto and you, and you go through those passages, it's dramatic. I don't have time to go through all of them this morning, but just love one another, be devoted to one another, honor one another, live in harmony with one another, build each other up, care for one another, serve one another, bear one another's burdens, forgive one another, be patient with one another, be kind and compassionate to one another, submit to each other, consider others better than yourselves, look to the interests of others, bear with one another, comfort, encourage each other, exhort, stir up, show hospitality to one another, pray for one another, and on and on and on it goes. I think it speaks to the value that God places on the human community and the community of faith learning to live otherwise. Otherwise, as compared to the way the world around us lives with self-interest at the focal point. I want to share with you words that I'm probably shared with you before, but they're some of the most profound words, I think, written by someone outside of Scripture. They come from a sermon preached by a fellow by the name of C.S. Lewis. Some of you might have heard of him. I don't know. There's a, a famous sermon he preached in Oxford called The Weight of Glory, right around the Second World War. And he says this, It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter. It's hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would strongly be tempted to worship. Or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if only in nightmares. And all day long, in some degree, we are helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, and all politics. There are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours like the life of a gnat. But it is immortals with whom we joke, work, marry, snub, and exploit, immortal horrors of everlasting splendors. This does not mean, by the way, he says, that we are to perpetually be solemn. We must play. But our merriment must be that of that kind, and it is, in fact, the merriest kind, which exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. No flippancy or superiority or presumption. And our charity must be real and costly love with deep feeling for the sins in spite of which we love the sinner. No mere tolerance or indulgence which parodies love as a flippancy parodies merriment. Next to the blessed sacrament, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. God has placed so many gifts in your hands and in mine. They all came from him. They all belong to him. Ultimately, we'll have to give an accounting for how we use them. The most precious of those gifts is sitting near you or next to you. The people in your family, in your cul-de-sac, in your row at church. The people God in his sovereign love for you has placed in proximity to you to help you become all that he's created and destined you to be and so that you can help them achieve the same. Now, in and of ourselves, left to our own devices, that is definitely mission impossible. Amen?
Come on, let's be real, right? But by the power of the Holy Spirit, when we allow Him to work in us and on us and through us, it changes radically our relationship to the things of this world and to the people around us. And praise God it does. Because it sets us free and gives us joy and allows us to love without condition the way that Jesus loves us. May God give us the grace to embrace that mission as stewards and caretakers of this world and of each other. Your mission should you choose to accept it, is to embrace his mission for you and for all of us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that this is your world. This is your creation. We want to take good care of it. God, folks have been meeting on the world stage. World leaders have been meeting, talking about environmental issues and how we can take better care of this this earth, and, 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 and they're doing it on a macro level, and, and we can't really participate in that, but we can do our part to be good stewards, uh, to try to be caretakers of this world, this environment. We can also be faithful stewards with the resources you put at our disposal, the material goods, the finances, our time, our, our, the, the things that we, we've been given, Lord. God, help us to be faithful in the small things, to do the best we can with what we have. And help us to love the people around us and to recognize that those people created in your image are people of inestimable worth and value. They're not just mere mortals, Lord. So God, help us to love and care for the people around us as faithful stewards, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.